Well, hi, good morning. Thanks so much for joining me in my shop. It's August 7th today. And so what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be investigating uh, the FM radio reception in this radio. Uh, my previous testing with an antenna suggests it's quite, uh, it's weak. It doesn't seem to receive very strongly and it never turns the stereo light on, which is a light bulb hidden under here. And so I don't think it ever actually trips into stereo either. So in order to check this out, I'm going to be using this instrument here. This guy here, which I'm going to talk a little bit about before we put it to work. So this is basically my own little private FM transmission station, if you like. It's a signal generator designed for FM uh, use. Just exactly what I'm going to do with it. The RF output comes out here and it's on its way to the antenna connection on the radio here, which I haven't quite made yet, but that's all you do. Just connect this to the antenna and away we go. So we have lots of options with this device. And maybe one of the things I want to talk a little bit about is the 19 kilohertz pilot carrier that's in here. Um, so when you receive FM uh, radio and it's in stereo, and you hear different sounds coming out of the left channel than out of the right channel. You might have wondered, how do they ever separate it? It's one signal, kinda, coming to your radio, and somehow your radio figures out which part is the left and which part is the right. It's not two separate FM signals coming and then going to the two channels. It's The FM signal is mixed together. It's done in a very selected way so that a a uh, non-stereo FM radio can still produce both channels out of the one speaker and not suffer from only getting one channel or the other because it's not stereo. So it's a bit of a trick that's played in how they manage to encode the uh, dual channel signal. And part of it involves an additional signal called a pilot signal. The pilot carrier is a tone at 19 kilohertz just above your hearing. Um, maybe the odd person can hear that if it's turned up loud enough. I don't know, but it's above your hearing. It's outside of the reception, the audio reception range of the FM radio on purpose. So the 19 kilohertz should never come out of the speaker, although I, you know, good chance your speaker couldn't reproduce it and your ears couldn't hear it anyway if it did. That 19 kilohertz subcarrier is then doubled in the receiver to 13, 38, sorry, 38 kilohertz. And then the 38 kilohertz is used, and there's a couple ways of looking at this, so I'll go the simple way. The uh, 38 kilohertz is used to switch the speakers. Left, then right, then left. Let's get a, let's get a correction. Left, then right, then left, then right, then left, then right. 38,000 times a second. So what you hear, well, you can't hear this switching going on back and forth. The signal being sent from the uh, radio station is in effect providing the two channels in a serial way. So you have the left, right, left, right, left, right. And your receiver is switching the left, right at the right rate and at the right timing so all the lefts end up in the left speaker and all the rights end up in the right speaker. So the 19 kilohertz pilot has to be sent by the station that's transmitting the FM signal you're listening to because it all has to be synced up with what they're doing. So every time you tune in an FM station with your radio, you're tuning in this 19 kilohertz pilot. It's the 19 kilohertz pilot detection inside the receiver that turns on the stereo light and enables the uh, um, decoding or uh, de demodulation or de decoding demultiplexing if you like of the uh, of the incoming signal now there's a whole other way of looking at this instead of uh, you know left right left right there's another way of looking at this which both of them are technically correct and mathematically rigorous oddly enough there are two ways of looking at how this is done but I won't go into the other way um, so that's what's going on so so this guy has to provide the 19 kilohertz and it has to be coordinated inside here with can, can you see it says left and right, so I can select which channel I want to send over, as long as a 19 kilohertz pilot is going. I can vary the strength of the 19 kilohertz pilot. 
Another thing I can do is I can vary the output signal from this. It's it's 100 megahertz plus or minus a little bit. So it can go down to maybe 95 up to 105, but it's really aimed for a 100 megahertz output. Uh, this thing also has a sweep function, but I won't describe that too much. I won't, I won't describe it now unless we go to use it, which we will probably have to use it at some point. It's not quite a real sweep. This kind of signal generator is often called a, a warbler or a wobbler um, for reasons that I, again, I won't go into. So we have different tone selections. We can make it produce a 400 hertz tone out of the speakers, so we can hear that, or a 1,000 or a 5,000 hertz tone. 19 kilohertz don't know I don't exactly know why these are here I believe I, I don't know why they're here on this instrument or how you're supposed to use them I'd have to read the manual to know for sure but there can be problems with the 19 kilohertz and you can see a 67 a 72 here um, I believe that many radios have traps to trap these frequencies well, that's probably a checking of the trap but I really I really don't know to be honest with you now in an in a regular AM radio, you know, uh, uh, simple uh, broadcast signal, all you're doing is varying the strength of the signal, and you can imagine quite quickly how that would end up m moving the, you know, being altered by the radio, so it can move the speaker cone. What's a little harder to understand is if you're sending an FM signal at 100 megahertz and you're just making it change in frequency, it's the same signal strength all the time. It's just going up and down in frequency. How is that ever converted into something that will make the speaker cone move? And it's a dirty trick. They use a dirty trick in FM radios, which I won't describe exactly at this point, but I'll just say this much. It's a dirty trick because near the end of the FM radio, it becomes an AM radio. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I won't go into details about that. It's a little too much to consume all at once. The main thing is to understand that this guy puts out varying signals, including this special 19 kilohertz. Oh, I was going to explain one more. So you can have the FM signal, and it can be varying a few um, uh, kilo, kilohertz, maybe kilohertz, would be the right word? Yeah, a few kilohertz either way, back and forth. Okay, great. And that would produce, see the pace of my hand? That would produce the speaker cone movement like that, okay, which we're not going to hear, obviously. I can't shake my hand at, uh, you know, 5,000 hertz or something. But there's a choice here. What about what about this? What if I do this? What if I make the signal vary not just a couple of kilohertz, but vary 40, 50 kilohertz back and forth? So is that louder than the speaker? No. <laughs> but there is a limit because if I go too big, it start crashing into stuff. So there's a standard. So radio stations are designed to go, I believe it's 70, 75 kilohertz, 50 kilohertz, I can't remember now, 75 kilohertz, I think. That's what they're aiming for. So they go from 100 megahertz, uh, I'm using the wrong terms here, 100 megahertz, and then they vary, the frequency modulates, it varies up and down as far as 75 kilohertz away from the center frequency. Of course, obviously, uh, the next channel has to be far enough away that it can do its wiggling and this can do this. And they don't, they don't crash into each other and then you have a mess in your receiver. So, uh, so that's just a little bit about what's going on. This has a control to adjust the amount of deviation in the FM signal. So we can set it with the, this control and this meter. This guy's on right now. He's operating. Well, let's, let's let's get the receiver going over here, and uh, see if we can pick up. See if we can pick it up. We're certain to pick that up. It is very powerful. So I'm gonna clip, clip onto the antenna here. FM antenna.
So we want to tune to 100, which is going to be roughly in the middle here. Kilohertz. Let's put this like this. We should be hearing it. We should be hearing it. It sure sounds like there's something going on right in here. Why no sound? First, I'm gonna. I think this is tuned into it. I can't be absolutely sure here. It's almost dead on 100 on the dial, so it's almost certainly. So I'm gonna move the frequency of the signal generator. Hear what that does. So you can hear some some like thumping sounds coming out of it. I would guess that's the uh, stereo feature coming on and off, even though the light, the light is not going. But we're not hearing any sound yet. Why is that? Why, what have you not done right over here, Jim? That's what's wrong. Okay, so what I had done was I was only sending over the 19 kilohertz pilot. The uh, signal you're listening to now was not coming over. Okay, well that, you know, another thing I can do is I can, I, I will do this, I'll take the output from here and I'll feed it right into my audio system. So you'll be listening to it on your, on the video, uh, exactly as it is left channel, right channel. A little hard with two speakers on my bench for you to know what is happening. But I'm going to make a quick check here, left and right. Um, I do have a stereo microphone. Now the only microphone that's on in here is the stereo microphone up over my bench. You can see it right here. It's got a left and a right, or one way or the other, and the speakers are like that. You might be able to hear the stereo. So I'm going to flip now. I'm going to make my signal generator send only a left channel and then only a right channel. And we'll hear it if the sound jumps back and forth. Or not, at least I will. I will hear it. Here we go. That's left only, right only. Nothing happening. I don't hear anything happening. Okay, so we're going to raise the subcarrier, the 19 kilohertz pilot carrier, up to the maximum my signal generator will produce. Let's see if we get this light to come on. Uh, hitting it with all the 19 kilohertz my guy has got. Um, should be right channel only. Sounds to me like it's coming out of both speakers. That should be left channel only. Still sounds like both speakers. Now it makes me think, is there a stereo button or something like that that I've overlooked here? I've got this mono simultan switch and we have a FMX. Why do they call it FMX? Why don't they call it FM Stereo? So I learned from the owner that this in fact is their stereo indicator and that is the uh, Claritone um, symbol, this weird arrow thing that they have. Well, other than the automatic frequency control, I see nothing in here that turns on or off on or off. How about that? So this, this meter is moving. So I haven't seen this meter move before. Hmm. Let's let's tune this radio and watch this meter. Oh very good. Watch how this meter moves.
I'm going to start out here. I'm going to tune across. What I want you to see is that it's not one event as you tune across. Watch. To the right. Wow, I got a strong signal. In the center. To the left. And back to the center. To the left and a right. That's not quite what I was thinking. <laughs> Doesn't matter. If you listen to the sound, stop watching the meter and listen to the sound. One, two, three. That's what I wanted to show. Three. So it was a small peak, big peak in the middle, and a small peak. And they were balanced. So this is an indication that the alignment is good on the radio. Meter may be deflecting a little further to the right than the left. Okay, let's get it in the middle now. Let's be right here. That's a perfectly tuned signal. Now to prove it, I'm blowing our ears off here. To prove it, I will vary the frequency of my signal generator and you'll see that meter move again. Put it back in the center. It can't be tuned any better. How come you're not showing any stereo indication there? And not a stereo indicator light. Let's put this on 400. It's a little easier to take. Now I'm running the uh, 19 kilohertz carrier full tilt. Let's just flip, flip around here. So I'm flipping left channel, right channel. Oh, it's it's definitely changing. So I'm going to back down to 19 kilohertz while I have this on the uh, on this speaker over here. I can hear quite clearly. I'm going to back down the 19 kilohertz until the stereo effect disappears. Right there. Didn't seem to come back. Tune it back and forth here a little bit. Interesting. Uh, when I started flipping channels, actually you can kind of see right through the <laughs> what I'm doing there. You can see the knobs on the uh, on the guy in the background there. The guy in the background, what a lazy talker. So there's a, some kind of stereo effect going on now. That doesn't sound right to me, but it only started when I flipped that switch. When I so I'm going to cut down the 19 kilohertz. Stereo's gone. Turn it back up. No stereo. Then I change the stereo left right. And on the on the second switch, it, it kicks in. Some it kicks in. And so what this is telling me is that. The, the radio is having a hard time receiving the 19 kilohertz. Um, why? Well, alignment or components. You know, pick your choice at this point. Um, but it does work. It will work if you have a stupidly strong station. Okay, so I think that's really all we need to do with this at this point uh, in terms of doing a test. the stereo light is on. See, I'm just a touch too tall to see it. The stereo light is on. I'm going to take out this bulb here if I can. Burning my fingers. There. There. Now we can see that the other bulb is on. Really? Okay, so I'm going to tune the radio in and out. There it goes. It did not come back. Just what I was hearing. And now I'm going to turn my signal generator uh, a left channel, right channel type thing. And 
there it turns on again. Again, I think that's just indicating that it's it's having a hard time picking it up because I am blasting a strong signal in here, 19 kilohertz. Let's turn it down until it goes off. There it goes. Turn it back up. It won't come back. Tune a bit. It won't. It won't come in. Well, very good because that proves that uh, the uh, set does work. It, I, I believe it's really more an alignment issue and one particular capacitor that I want to find. So we're going to jump to the schematic now. I'm going to hunt down a particular capacitor. It might be wise to run through the alignment instructions once at this point because this is what's coming. I'm going to skip the AM part for now. We're just going to look at the FM alignment. The FM alignment comes in two sections. This, this section here and then down here is another section that multiplex the decoder alignment. So we're just going to read through this kind of lightly and just to get an idea of what's coming here. Uh, first of all, these uh, circuits, if these have to be built, coax from FM sweep. Well, you know what? My sweeper, the device I've been using this morning, actually has this output already set up. And then what is this one for? Keep leads as short as possible to scope. Well, at some point we need circuit D. Probably, probably right here. Okay, so we start. Let's see. Via a 300 ohm matching pad. That's what this is. This is a 300 ohm matching pad signal generator connection signal generator frequency I can't do this I can't do 108 I can't do can't do this signal generator output to be adjusted at all times below overload output level whatever that is 108 why you doing why not 100 that's where I'd have to do it at 100 10.7 marker signal generator frequency okay so let's go Test point one, so we got to identify where the test points are. In the tuner, adjust this board, primary, secondary, turn out, uh, any order or optimum amplitude. Symmetry of the IF pass, pass band curve, cores to be adjusted away from each other. Okay, so all these things, I'm just, just loading it in my head. At this point, I'm really not trying to understand it fully. This is always the same. This changes to 92 at this point, which I can't do. If necessary to make a pointer coincide with 92, the maximum amplitude repeats up to two and three further improvement. If necessary to make pointer 108 to maximize the amplitude. I'm not exactly sure what they're saying there. Oscilloscope to point AFC on blah, blah, blah. Etinkata, tutututa. Holy smokes. Here's some diagrams I should get on my scope if I'm doing things right. It's actually giving the uh, bandpass curve. Wow, okay. Challenges. FM stereo multiplex alignment. Connect composite signal generator to antenna terminal through matching pad as in FM alignment. Connect composite signal generator. Tune the frequency of generator but unused by regular transmissions. Audio VTVM to record sockets on access brackets. Okay, uh, generator to that amount on VTVM. Why, yeah, yeah, yeah. Composite signal generator to antenna terminal. This stuff just output is in. This is just to get the output to the right level. Junction, like some transistors. Uh, adjust for a minimum indication of the 67.5. So there's the 67 signal that my generator can produce. So often what happens here uh, is you, know, you have a certain set of equipment that you can use, I do, and these guys wrote this around a slightly different set of equipment, um, which I can't do everything they're saying here about you know, picking the right frequency in that. Okay, generator does not have a signal. Step two has to be omitted must be tuned on a transmission for minimum SCA interference. SCA, sub carrier administration. So, have you ever been in an elevator? 
and there's music playing. I don't think it happens much anymore, but there was a time where you got into elevators and there was some music playing, or, or you're in the uh, grocery store and there's music playing, or, or somewhere in a public setting and there's usually some pretty milk toast music playing. Where is it coming from? It's coming from somebody's FM radio, this SCA signal. The, each radio station, a commercial radio station, does not consume its entire band allotment by sending out the left channel, right channel, and the pilot signal. There's room for more inside the allotment. And so the last little bit is taken up with an entirely different program. Can you believe it? So you tune in an FM station on your radio and you're listening to music. There's another a program in there that your radio is ignoring but other radios will receive it so in these elevators they have radios they have FM radios but they tune to this SCA signal and they ignore the regular commercial signal so it's just another radio and so all the radio stations that broadcast the commercial stuff you listen to not, not all of them but many of them also broadcast stuff on the SCA fre frequency or channel if you can call it that and uh, there you go. It's everywhere and no one knows. That's what SEA is. So I guess SEA interference would be something to do with this other signal I'm telling you about getting in with the regular commercial signal and coming out of your speaker. Alternate method. Tune in a strong stereo, switch on AFC, attach a oscilloscope, peak those guys for maximum 19 kilohertz signal. How, how, how would you know? The FM station transmits the FM station transmits station tests where only one channel is used, then a further slight <laughs> So wait until your FM station broadcasts a station test. Well and it's never gonna happen. For this type of adjustment, the tuning of the station must be done very critically. And a lot of these FM radios, this is this is really important all the time. You have to tune them very, very carefully to get the right kind of sound out of them. Okay, so that was a quick trip through there. Now I know what I'm up against. We want to look at the schematic here and I want to find a particular capacitor. Now this capacitor is going to be involved in the, the uh, detection part of the FM radio. It's going to be in here. Let's zoom in on it here. So, you know, this right away, th this is catching my eye here. Look, that, that this is the FM detector here. This is also catching my eye the same way. Look, it says 19 kilohertz right there. So remember, the 19 kilohertz brought into the radio, doubled to 38, and then applied against the uh, demultiplexer circuit, which is in here somewhere. Let's go back to this. So this is the detector. I'm quite sure of that. And what I'm looking for is an electrolytic capacitor. Can you see it? It's right there. Let me zoom in a little more here. I'm not sure if it's gonna help. Right there, that guy. C223. Uh, it looks like it's, it looks like I got 10 and 16 written here. C223. Let's see about that. C22. Oops, wrong. Wrong way. C223. Oh, sideways. That's the bottom. So we're looking at the parts list for C223. Uh, F. Uh, this is it. C. C2. C223, 10 microfarad, 16 volts, that's what I thought. We need to replace this capacitor. This capacitor plays a very important role in the uh, demodulation or de de detection of the uh, FM signal. No reason to know that this guy is bad right now, but of all the capacitors in here that are doing something to the FM signal, this is probably the most likely character uh, offhand to
to be causing a problem. So we need to find C223 on the circuit board. On the circuit board. Where's those circuit boards? They're not up here. They're way down here. There they are. So, um, so it's the upper board, audio board, RF board. It's up here. Uh, it's going to be near, here's, uh, this looks like the detector, the C223, it's an electrolytic capacitor, so it should stand out, C218. Okay, maybe it's over here. C there it is, C223. This is the guy we gotta find, we gotta change him. C223. Should be easy to find. Okay, let's go looking for him. Okay, let's see if this, this helps or hurts. Um, first of all, is that diagram aligning at all with these? With what we're seeing? Offhand, I don't think it is. Uh, it looks to me like it's you know, upside down or something. And what I'm looking for are these cans. So the, these cans should be marked on there, and I think one of them is marked. That's this one up here. If I, let me look at the other the other diagram here. Yeah, here's the rest of the cans. Okay, so we have we have the cans. have the can. This is the lone can and straight down from it is the capacitor. Okay, so this is easy. Now, I think there's the lone can and straight up from it is the capacitor. There's one there, there's another capacitor right there. Now what, what's that one? Is that one here? Yes, 227 no reason for me to jump to the conclusion that this one should go too but you know soldering iron everything out this capacitor is popping open here on the end I can see gunk gunk coming out of it or something something's coming out of it and probably none of these are any better let's just count them up here one two three four Maybe that's one there. Six. Couple. No, I'll take that back. Five electrolytic. Six. That big guy is a bit, you know, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. The bigger they are, the bigger the job they're doing. Not necessarily true, but that's kind of just a rule of thumb. Well, we'll take the one that's there out and, uh, We'll test it, and then we'll replace it. Okay, power off before I forget. That's what's coming next. So sometimes getting a part off these boards is, is, is more difficult than you might imagine. And one of the problems is identifying you know, which solder terminal goes with the part you're after. So what I've done here is I have a hook on the end of this tool, and I've hooked the end of the component down there that I'm after. So if I pull on this, I'm pulling directly on the uh, directly on the uh, uh, piece of wire coming out of the end of it. <laughs> so now, in order to determine which one of these it is, I stick my oh-so intelligent finger right on the capacitor that I'm after. And then a, just think with your head. That's the best thing to think with, actually. You just point to your finger. It's right there. <laughs> really? I don't know. Funny, last time I did this, I ended up over here. So, I, I think it might be over here now. <laughs> See what I mean? It's hard to tell. So I'm going to have to probably uh, liquefy a few of these, and the one I'm pulling on is the one that will pop through. 
So let me get my tool back on here. Okay. Uh oh. I have a cold soldering iron here. That's not going to do. second for this to warm up okay okay now applying the extraction pressure where are we again I think, I think it's this one right here appears not to be now these guys this one isn't but a lot of these they fold over the lead and so pulling on it may not be enough. Is it this guy? No. How about this one? No. so wrong. So we're pretty much dead center of the board. I think it's this one. Right? But it does not want to pull out. enough there. Okay, so that's one side. Now we'll go to the other side and repeat the process. This came out of here. Wait a minute. Where did it come out? came out over here this one. So this one. There it goes. Here we are. We're gonna, we're gonna test that little guy there. Let's see what happens. Can you see the gunk has come out? the end there you can kind of get an idea that something doesn't look right that end that end looks nice but this end not so nice okay what was this supposed to be this is supposed to be a 10 wasn't it a 10 at 16 volts let's, let's double check that first We're looking at this and see if it doesn't say 10 at 16 10 16 10 at 16. 10. Da, 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 da. So that should be 10,000 nanofarads. It's reading ten, uh, uh, 6. And v loss, 35%. That's the worst I've ever seen. That's the worst I've ever seen. Okay, so we're going to put a new capacitor in. Uh, the other ones, probably all in exactly the same condition, but they may not be having much of an impact on the radio. Uh, let's see. Yeah, let's replace that one. I'll see if I have one of those. 10 at 16. Okay, I got a couple choices here. What what happened? What? Well, that's weird. There were three capacitors here a second ago. What happened? That's a mystery. I don't know what I did. 
Okay, there we are. That's the original. This is a 10 at uh, 16, it's exactly the same rating, and this is a 10 at 50. Uh, this is a newer capacitor than this one, uh, but n these two are not particularly old. These are, could consider these brand new stock. Let's test it. Test them. This should test just fine. Shows 10 microfarads and uh, loss is 1.5%. Okay. That's good. I might as well check this one too. Just get more familiar with my own stock here of parts. Sixteen. Sixteen. So the thing about um, these uh, electrolytic capacitors, certainly in the old days, they could not make these things very precise or consistent coming out of the factory. So they tended to make them much bigger than what they were selling them as. That could be the case with this one. Because it says on it, doesn't it say on it 10? Did I make a mistake? Ten at sixteen. What exactly does it say there? Ten at sixteen volts DC plus side is here. So I don't know why this is reading so much higher, but we're gonna put this one in anyway. Oh, not this one. Hey, where'd it go again? What <laughs> it's disappearing at? Do I keep putting it back in the box? Put on the end of these and how oh, mysterious of me. Okay, so now you got to make sure these go in the right way, polarize the right way. I could actually install this under here, you know, which would be easier to some degree, but I won't. So the negative, the negative, you know, I, I didn't really make a good observation of the polarity here, uh, but let me put this on the screen here just one sec. So the capacitor is like this, and I know from earlier research, this is the positive side of this capacitor. So that's the way it goes in. Positive this way, negative that way. So positive towards all those cans, negative away from all the cans. Okay, I think I got it. The deal with me on these things is that half the time I get the polarity wrong, try as I may not to. So we'll try to spread these out, roughly the spacing we can find from here to here. Get the right kind of spacing so we don't have a problem with that. Good. Now, the negative is marked with that. This is the negative. The negative, he says, I'm going to remind myself because this is where I go wrong. The negative is away from the cans. The positive towards the cans. Okay. Cans are that way. Going in this way. The negative here. I can't possibly get this wrong. Okay, I'm going to try to stick it through the holes. Okay, it doesn't want to come through the one because the solder is blocking it. There we go. Okay, it's through. Just take a look from the top. It looks good. Good. So if you have a, a stereo of this vintage, like I do, I have two actually. Uh, my original college stereo, my wife and I use it almost every day. It's just behind me here. Uh, 
you can see it there sticking out of my shell. That guy has two meters on it. It has a centering meter and a signal strength meter. Right? So as you tune in the FM, this is the centering one. You know, it swings around, and when you get it in the center, the signal strength should be up at the top. But on both of my stereos, that's not what happens. When the signal strength is at the top, this is over here somewhere. And I have to kind of fiddle with it to try to get the best, you know, all-around arrangement. That kind of problem can be related to this capacitor I'm changing. It's more likely a alignment, a very, very minor alignment issue. So I, both of my stereos need to get on this bench and be adjusted. But uh, I, I'm very tolerant of having things only working at 80%, <laughs> including me. Very tolerant. So, uh, solder, we gotta solder it in. We gotta solder that in. Don't put the solder away. Stop talking, start doing. So, with the success I've been having with this project, as compared to the last few projects I've worked on, I've been feeling great. I find that my, my day goes with these projects. If, if, if I'm in here in the morning and things don't go well, the rest of my day is kind of messed up. So I've been having a good days. And frankly, I'm sure this is true for anybody doing this kind of work, maybe you. When things aren't going well, it starts getting tough coming in here and pushing, pushing on. They keep pushing. Um, they can get tough. But uh, persistence is the key to success in so many things. What's this doing here? Yeah. I have a couple different types in there. That's what's going on. Very good. Okay, let's try them out now. And uh, because I did the earlier testing with the instrument, we have some chance of having a uh, quantitative uh, impression of whether this really helped or not. Okay, so we swing them around. should be okay. We're still transmitting our thing. Let me just turn off my solder machine here. Okay, we're ready. Volume down. Switch off. Power on. Switch on. Okay. All is good. Volume up. Go. What are we doing here? It looks like we are running a stereo signal. I don't see any stereo light. Let's try tuning the radio first. Plenty strong. I mean, it's a really strong signal. Right in the middle. Still no stereo light. Um, are we definitely on stereo? We should be transmitting a right channel signal. Now the last time all I did was flip the audio from the left channel, right channel, and back, and then that somehow triggered this. Let's just try that. Right channel, left channel, right channel. And there it came. I had to do it a few times. They can hear the change in the room when that came on. So just changing that capacitor is not enough. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be headlong into the alignment uh, process here, which I read through once briefly, which requires the 
yeah, it requires all right. Is there anything I'm not thinking of? have a strong signal piling in here. So that's a low signal. That's as strong as it comes. Where did that go go? It quit. Let's fool around with the uh, 19 kilohertz on and off. Off. Oh, that's interesting. The radio sound changed. Let me just turn down the output a little bit. No, well, it's actually the sound. Let's tune the radio. Why, why did the sound change? Why did the sound change? Right and left? Shouldn't make any difference now. Doesn't seem to make any difference. So now what we're sending is a mono signal. You know what? I've had the uh, stereo off. I'm crying out loud. Let's go back. Stereo on. I've had the stereo off. Make that light come on. I want that light to come on. Come on, Mr. Light. Okay, I'll do the left channel, right channel thing again. <laughs> the light comes on. So again, it's, it's as if it's close to working, just not quite there, and when I send some crazy signal briefly switching left and right, that's enough to trigger it over the hill. Over the hill. So what about this uh, AFC? Now what are we on? We're on, let me go back to this mono. Okay, set the deviation within the normal range. Turn, tune this out just a little bit. A little bit. Turn on, see if this pops in the middle. Yeah, see so it go in the middle. So the automatic frequency control function is functioning. Let's see if we can hear that on tuning. So we have it off, so the tuning should be, should not be grabby. Sure didn't seem grabby to me. Okay, now it should be grabby. Yep, did you hear it pop in? And pop out. Good. The AFC is working. Uh, this contour control. What the heck is a contour control? Uh, what happened to the radio? Like a ton tonal change of some sort. I mean, we're listening to a, a single frequency, so we can't can't really appreciate what this is doing. I'm willing to bet this is the uh, this is their version of a. Uh, Um, their version of a uh, loudness control. Loudness control peaks the bass and treble up a little bit when the volume is generally low because of the way our ears hear. As the sound level goes down, we don't hear highs and lows as well. What we're left with is the voice range. So at a very low level, we are still sensitive to the human voice range, but we've, we've dropped off the other stuff. So when you're listening to your stereo very low, you tend not to hear the trouble in the bass as much as you might like. Loudness control. So it's called. It's called different things in different different ways. So maybe in this one it's called a contour control. Well, uh, let's see. Options are change out a few more of those electrolytic capacitors that I counted up four or five of them. See what that does. Uh, maybe focus on this big one. What's this big one doing? 
those are all shots in the dark. Uh, but considering how bad this one was, the others are probably in the same state. So that's possible. Another thing that could be done is the alignment process could be maybe not fully undertaken, but, but could be tested to see if there isn't some value in going through the alignment process. The problem with that is the fiddling will almost certainly guarantee it has to be aligned afterwards. So, uh, and uh, I tend to get carried away when I start fiddling. So you make a little adjustment, oh yeah, make a little more, oh yeah, well where'd that come from? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if I want to do that. Got to ponder these options a little bit. Maybe the answer is, if I'm really on my way to changing these other capacitors, I should just do it now. That should be the next step. I think so. I think so. And let's end today trying to listen to a program on here, if we can. Uh, so that means off with the signal generator. Any old kind of antenna. I'm not going to bother with the big guy. I'm just going to put a single piece of wire on here. And that's not exactly the best way to do this, but let's see what happens. Okay, everybody stay up there. Don't fall. Well, it's featuring Rascal Flatts, Unfilled <laughs> Race. Hey, it's Steve Jones. When bands are first getting started, like the guys in Apollo LTD, it may not be like we think. Sometimes we have visions of somebody getting sent into a record label or something and they are traveling the world in private jets and they are living in multi-million dollar houses and eating at the best restaurants in the world but no stereo when you're just getting started meals can be very very basic honestly it was, we used to, we used it was to eat bad. a can of black beans for dinner like we just buy them and... oh yeah wow okay Clears up, does it? So, in my mind, when you tune through a station, you should hear a weak. Ver okay, well, a little bit of a problem here. You see the big hard drive on my bench. So, what happened to the last video? You were just watching it, kind of just stop midward is my computer hard drive got full and the recording just stopped. I didn't notice it right away. Um, so some portion of what I was doing didn't get captured on video, but not much, just a couple minutes. Basically, all that got missed was me debating with myself over whether I should try aligning the radio next or continue with the replacement of a few more of these electrolytic capacitors. And I think the capacitors won the argument. I can't even remember. So that's what's next more electrolytic capacitors to get out of here then an alignment so thanks a lot for watching uh, today and uh, we'll carry on some more tomorrow see ya <laughs>